Good morning, church. Welcome. Um, our first song today is going to be This Little Light of Mine. So I thought I'd read Matthew chapter 5, verses 14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Please stand.
Everybody. Happy Sabbath. Good to see you. I see a lot of people smiling. That's a good thing. The church looks a bit empty today because half of our church is in Egypt at the moment. I hope the people of Israel come out of Egypt and come back uh, safely. So let's pray for them. I, uh, I'm trying to avoid Facebook and Instagram because I'm getting more jealous every day. I see all the good food and the good places that they're going. So if you haven't been on Facebook or Instagram, don't go. You're going to get too jealous. And then I think a lot of people are on holiday. It's still big camp up north. So a lot of places to go, but we're glad that you've made it to Kingscliff because it's going to be a good Sabbath. We have Joel preaching today. Where's Joel? He was here around somewhere. So those of you that know Joel, he's a, a favorite here at our church. We know him really well. And today we actually have Joel's name for the first reading to be moved back into Kingscliff Church. So we're moving his name back into Kingscliff Church. I'll just give you a very quick, he'll maybe share a little bit more about that. But Joel is, where's Joel? He was maybe just ran out quickly. So Joel is, um, used to be the pastor here. He is now moving to Africa, actually, to do some mission work there. And so he's moving his name back to Kingsliff Church because Kingsliff Church will be his home base as he ministers in Africa. He will give us updates, and we will see if there's a possibility. Hello, Joel. <laughs> Everybody awkwardly look at Joel. Um, Joel will be ministering in Africa, like I said, and he will have this church as his home base. He'll come back and send us some updates even maybe send us some needs that they might have in the mission field over there. And so we're very encouraged to see God sending um, people out to mission, not just local mission, but even international mission. And we're here to support Joel and support him in what he's doing and uh, pray that God will be with him and bless him and keep him. He's a, a man of great talent and a man that does amazing things. And we know that God is going to use him there. So thank you, Joel. Joel's going to share today with us, and we're so grateful. And today's the first reading, um, and next week we'll have his second reading. Thank you so much. Good morning, church. For those who don't know me, my name's Katie, and I'm just wanting to come and give a little bit of an update on our playgroup ministry that started this week. So there might be some photos up on the screen here. Um, really excited. I got up here um, probably a couple months ago sharing that I was going to be starting a mum's group and that the dream would be to have a playgroup. I didn't think that I'd be standing here only like two months later with that actually taking place. So I want to say a big thank you for the church and your support that we actually got things up and running. So this week was our first week. We were, yeah, blessed with having over 20 kids there. I think there was 21 kids and 12 parents. Most of those um, were individuals I had not met before. They came along because they had heard it advertising in the community. So that's a real, really, really exciting. Um, you can see the, there's another two photos you'll get to see. There was some craft that we did. We had lots of fun and games out on the grass. And then we also had some stories and some song time um, and a morning tea. It was, yeah, 
a lot of fun, as you can see. Um, and also a big thank you to our volunteers that came and helped make it possible. Without them, it definitely wouldn't have run. So I just wanted to yeah, get up and give a little bit of an update. If you're interested in finding out more information, we're um, having two weeks off while it's school holidays and we'll be returning um, to run it through term four. Um, here's our information up on the screen. If you check out that QR code, if you are a mum or you know a mum that might be interested, all our communication and updates is being shared on our Facebook community group, which is Kingscliff Mums at the Table. Um, but you can also see the details up there. So a big thank you for everyone's support and encouragement. And if there is anyone who's interested in wanting to come and help and volunteer by cutting up fruit or just chatting to some of the mums that come along, um, please come and speak to myself. I would love to share with you how you can connect and engage. So, yeah, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to seeing how our church facility here can really be a blessing, not just to our mums here, but to our community as well. Thank you. Hello. Oh, there I am. Um, I have the pleasure this morning to invite you all for offering. Can I please have the deacons come to the front, please? Um, so this week's offering is actually for our local church budget. So lights, aircon, um, all that kind of thing, car park, <laughs> um, all that kind of thing helps to let the church run. You don't feel as though you need to give, but if you can, that's wonderful. Um, so I'm just going to pray uh, and then we'll have some music. Um, Dear Heavenly Father, please be with the offering. Please help it to um, grow, to spread your word and allow us to have the means and the knowledge and guidance to be able to use it to your will. In your name we pray. Amen. I also believe that this QR code is for the e-giving app, is that right? Yes. So if you don't have cash, that is, oh, wrong side, that QR code is for the e-giving app, so you can do whatever you, you can give or you can do your tithe or whatever through that app.
mornings. I'm taking the children's story. So are there any children here that can come down to the front? Great. Good morning, guys. How are you? Could I have a volunteer? All right. Um, maybe you. Could you wear this bag? All right. And then it's got some straps. You can buckle them up as well. That's good. It looks good on you. All right. Have you guys ever done anything that's wrong? That's good. You're, you're like me. Um, so, hypothetically... We're just using you. What was your name? What's something that you've done that's wrong that's made you feel guilty? Okay, maybe you've told a lie. Could I get another volunteer? Can you run over there and pick up one of those heavy weights? Yeah. So you've told a lie and... Let's say you got away with it. No one found out about your lie. Yeah, drop it in the bag. <laughs> Can you feel that burden? Yeah. All right, something else that you might do that's wrong. Does anyone have any ideas? Take something and it wasn't yours. Yeah, stealing something. All right, thank you for bringing those closer. Do you want to grab another one? So maybe you stole something. And no one found out about it. <laughs> How does it feel? Heavy. Heavy? Okay, so that's pretty heavy. Does anyone have another example? Something that you might do that's wrong? Maybe no one would find out. Yeah? He stole an egg from a bird's nest. Oh, he stole an egg from a bird's nest. That's not good, is it? All right, let's go another one. Is that getting pretty heavy? Yes. Okay, one more example. Okay. Disobeying your parents. Yeah, disobeying your parents. That's not good. All right, last one. How does it feel now? Really heavy? Yes. It's really heavy. How are you going to get rid of this burden? I'm going to read you a Bible text. All right, I'm reading in Matthew 11, verse 28. It reads... Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. We might substitute heavy backpack. Take my yoke, my backpack upon you, and learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and I will give you rest for your souls. My backpack is light. My backpack is comfortable, and my burden is light. Does that sound good? So Jesus here is offering... <laughs> to switch bags with you. His burden is light, so you can take off the backpack. <laughs> Thanks for being a good volunteer. So yeah, that's just a reminder that when you guys do something wrong, you can always go to Jesus and tell him, and he's always ready to forgive you. All right, thanks, guys. You can go back to your seats. Great story, Daniel. Calibrating the weights was... Yeah. All right. Um, Sam is my name, and I've been asked to lead us as a church family in prayer. So if you um, are able, take a posture of prayer that's comfortable for you, and let's bow our heads together. Father in heaven, we thank you that it's Sabbath, and we thank you that we're part of a church family. 
Lord, that has one mission, one vision, and that's to represent your love to a world that needs hope and um, that is in darkness in, in lots of different ways. And Lord, we just want to, we, we think of our friends at the moment that are traveling in Egypt and experiencing all that they are, they are there. And we think of the story you called the Hebrews out of Egypt to be your special and chosen people, not to be set apart for their own sake and privilege and luxury, but Lord, to be a blessing to other people. And this week, we have gone about our vocations and our social groups and our just day-to-day -day interactions that seem small and that seem normal, but are all opportunities to influence people for your kingdom and to share your love with others. And so we just want to lay on the altar all that we've done this week. Um, we pray that you'd forgive us for where we haven't shone your light in, in our community. But scripture says that unless you build our house that we labor on, Lord, we labor in vain. And unless you look out for the city that we live in and that we um, find safety in, then, then we keep watch in vain. And so we just pray that you would preside over everything we've done, everything we're going to do this coming week, and just add your spirit to the conversations, the interactions that we've had in the community, Lord. May the seeds of the gospel take root in people's heart, and may people start to come and, and worship with us and find the blessing that we have here in community, having um, support and encouragement, and just that routine in our life where we know there's a safe space and a place of rest each week. And so as we bathe in that today, um, listening to songs and praising your name, um, giving of the things that you've poured into our life, the material wealth, and Lord, as we listen to the bread of life that's broken here through Joel as he shares scripture with us, we just pray that your spirit would draw near to us and encourage us and fill us with what we need for the week ahead. And we want to pray a special prayer for those that are ill, um, those that are recovering. Lord, we pray that you'd put your healing hand on them and um, restore them to full health soon. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good morning, church. How are we this morning? You doing well? Yeah, I need some weight for sure. Definitely. Thank you so much. It is a blessing to be here with you this morning. And it would have been nice timing to vote me into membership today, Quentin. Um, yeah, the, this sermon might change the outcome of that vote. So it's a little bit nerve wracking now, kind of getting up here, knowing that you'll be voting on my membership next week. But um, yeah, I pray that you'll have mercy on me for sure. <laughs> We're going to be in Mark chapter 1 today, and the title of our message is At What Cost? And so we'll be looking here at a scripture in Mark chapter 1 and looking at our theme, At What Cost? And don't get too nervous. Uh, you won't need your wallet at the end of this message um, although it could be appropriate, so we'll see, see where we go. But we are looking at a message entitled, At What Cost? from the book of Mark in chapter 1. And so let's all go in our Bibles together to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading here in verse 40. Mark chapter 1 and verse 40. It says, now a leper came to him imploring him. Now, this is speaking of Jesus. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See, that, uh, that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places. And they came to him 
from every direction. Let's bow our heads for a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to ask that your spirit would be present here as we consider things in your word. The great themes of scripture, Father, we pray that it would come to life, that your spirit would speak to us, that our hearts may be warmed. We pray that you would speak to us in our situation, in our condition this morning. We pray this not because we need it, but because you want to give it. We pray that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are here in Mark chapter 1, and we are, we are going to just move through systematically, verse by verse, and unpack. Hudson, I don't know why, but my clicker isn't working for some reason. I'm guessing it's because you're using the computer. Let's go to Mark chapter 1, and we're going to re begin reading verse 40 once more. Mark chapter 1 and verse 40. And it says here, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, what does the Bible say? You can make me clean. Interestingly, leprosy was somewhat common in the ancient world. And when I say somewhat common, Leprosy encapsulated a lot of different skin conditions and ailments that people might commonly have in the ancient world. But leprosy, biblically speaking, was referring to a, a specific um, condition that was going to be targeting the central nervous system. And so I've just got a brief description here. It's from Answers in Genesis. If anyone knows this website, it's quite helpful. And it says here that many have thought leprosy to be a disease of the what? Of the skin. But it is better classified, however, as a disease of the nervous system because the leprosy bacterium attacks the nerves. It goes on to say its symptoms start in the skin and peripheral nervous system then spread to the other parts, such as the hands, feet, face, earlobes, and patients with leprosy experience disfigurement of the skin and bones and twisting of the limbs and curling of the fingers to form the characteristic claw hand. It goes on to say that tumor-like growths called lepromas may form on the skin and in the respiratory tract, and the optic nerve may deteriorate. The largest number of deformities develop from the loss of pain sensation due to extensive nerve damage. For instance, inattentive patients can pick up a cup of hot boiling water without flinching. And so you, you have this situation, this condition where this man has been um, facing, dealing with this leprosy. He has this condition that is attacking his nervous system and it's causing disfigurement. It's causing the, this ailment that is, that is going to be causing him to be undesirable to others in his community. People can see that he has this condition. And so there are some consequences to this, 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 this physical manifestation of this thing that is attacking his nervous system. Notice here in the book of Leviticus what it says in chapter 13. It says, Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn, his head shall be bare, he shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean, unclean. He shall be unclean all the days he has the sore. He shall be unclean, he is unclean, and he shall dwell alone, his dwelling shall be where? Outside of the camp. So Leviticus starts to paint a little bit of a picture as to what this man's condition meant for his lifestyle. He was a loner, he was unclean, he was to live outside of the camp, totally disconnected from his family, from his friends, from his loved ones. He was forced into isolation. Does this sound like the kind of living situation, living conditions that you would desire for yourself? Imagine being disconnected from your family. Imagine being disconnected from your children. Imagine being disconnected from those that you love because you've got this disfigurement. And every time you come in contact with people, what do you to scream? Unclean, unclean. Truly in the ancient world, this would have been a fate worse than death. This would have been something that you would not have wished on your worst enemy. 
you would not want anyone to experience or endure the hardship that would come as a result of getting leprosy. Every time coming into the public sphere, yelling out, before anyone knows your name, they know that you are what? Unclean. Your hair is different. Your mustache covered. How embarrassing to cover your mustache. It's terrible. Your, your jeans are ripped. It's, it's crazy, right? To think that this person would have to visibly demonstrate the fact that they have this ailment that is separating them from everyone. But notice here this leper in the gospel account comes to Jesus and asks him this question. What does he say? If you are willing... If you are willing, this is a powerful question, friends. I want to draw you into just how powerful this idea is, that this leper would come to Jesus and ask him, if you are willing, you will make me clean. Because here in the ancient world, the, the context that we are dealing with here today, there has not been a healing of leprosy since the days of Elijah. And so we actually get this sense that this is not a common occurrence, that anyone has found a cure for this disease. And so coming and asking Jesus, if you are willing to make me clean from something that people haven't been cleansed from for hundreds of years, is a big deal. Are you following with me, church? It's a big deal to expect of Jesus that he would be able to do something that the doctors couldn't do. He would be able to do something that the medical professionals or even the priests themselves would not be able to do. This man is expecting a miracle. But I love the question because it's a question of what? Preference. He's not saying, if you are able to cleanse me, then do it. That would be a question of power, amen? He's asking, if you are willing, if you want to, in other words, imagine the power that Jesus possesses, that if he is willing, every issue that this man or the main cause of the issues in this man's life could be dissipating in a second. This man's life could be totally changed, totally transformed in a moment if Jesus is willing. If you are willing, the man says, you can make me clean. Let's keep reading here and see what happens. It says, then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Notice here a definition of this word compassion. It is a sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to what? Alleviate it. A desire to alleviate it. I find it very interesting that Jesus here in this passage is moved with compassion. He doesn't just sit back and have compassion on society. He is, he is moved with compassion. He is driven by his compassion. It's not just this feeling that he has towards those that he sees that are struggling. It actually moves him. It actually drives him. It causes him to do something. It causes him to act. And so we have this idea that Jesus being moved by compassion does something in response to this man's condition. And I want to highlight three things here for you. I want to highlight the fact that first of all, Jesus had an awareness of this man's condition. Amen? And if Jesus had an awareness, a consciousness of this man's condition... The next question is, does he have a desire to alleviate it? That's part of the definition that we saw of compassion. It's not just an awareness. It's actually a desire to do something about this man's condition. And then the third thing here that we see is Jesus acted upon. His awareness, his desire leads to action. Amen? He is moved with compassion. He does something about this knowledge that he has, this awareness that he has of this man's condition. 
It moves him. It drives him to do something. It drives him to reach out and connect. Let's continue reading here in Mark chapter 1, verses 42 and beyond. It says, As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed, and he strictly warned him, And sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for yourself cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Let's not overlook the fact that this man who came to Jesus with this skin condition, as Jesus was moved with compassion, received healing in that moment. That is a miracle, amen? Jesus has just done a miracle. He's done something that was outside of the natural order. It was not natural for this man to find remedy for his condition. And yet Jesus has just been able, through supernatural intervention, through divine intervention in this man's life, he has been able to bring about transformation. Is Jesus still able to do that today, friends? Is is God still able to intervene in the human story? Is God still able to intervene in the natural order? That is why God is God and we are not. We pray to a God that is able to do things that we ourselves cannot. He does not have the same limitations that we have. And it is important, it is imperative that we understand that when we relate to God, when we relate to Jesus, that we are relating to someone that has the power to transform. Totally transform. The question is, is he willing? The question is, does he want to? Not, is he able And that gets a little bit tricky for us sometimes. When we're wrestling in situations when a miracle would be so convenient for us. When we're wrestling in situations where we are reliant on a miracle. And we understand that God is able, but He chooses not to. It causes us to question, amen? Isn't that natural? Very natural for us to question in those moments. But it is in that very moment that we have an opportunity to realize that God is God and that we are not. And our natural order is below, under, in submission to. It is in these moments that we see who we truly believe is God. Is it us and our desires Or do we actually believe that Jesus himself is God? God is able. This man is healed. This man is healed. But as he is healed, he is given a stern warning. Does this seem strange to anyone else? That as he's healed, he's given this warning not to go and tell anyone? We have to ask ourselves this question. Is this because Jesus has a desire for self-preservation? Is this a selfish thing that Jesus is asking of this man? Is this just so that Jesus can go on doing what he wants to do and not be impacted by this man going and telling everyone and creating a fanfare? It's easy to assume that that is the case. But as we read here, we are understanding that there was a natural order when A miracle took place and there was built into Jewish society or the religious institution room for miracles to take place, even of this magnitude. And the correct thing would have been for this man to go and present himself to the priest and there was particular offerings that he would bring for being cured of such a thing and he would present himself to the priest as a what? A living testimony of God's goodness. Amen? So this man is to come into the presence of the priest and he is to show himself that he has been healed of leprosy. Now, I've done some reading on this because I really wasn't comfortable with this idea that Jesus would be warning him for his own gain. 
Don't say anything just so it doesn't impact me. What he is doing here is actually giving this man the best chance that he can to go in before the priests. We're only in Mark chapter 1, but the priests are all, already holding prejudice against Jesus. They're already questioning what it is that he's trying to do here. He's upsetting society already. He's already provoking the religious leaders. And so here we have this man who is about to come and present himself as being healed of leprosy. And if he comes and they know that Jesus has been the one that healed him, it is going to raise question. Does that make sense? It is going to cause them to doubt the validity of this miracle. Jesus would prefer this man to come before the religious leaders on his own back so that it would force them to question what it was that was happening that would cause this man to be healed instead of knowing beforehand that it was a result of Jesus' ministry and work in that community. This man stands according to Scripture, according to Jesus, as a living testimony And I believe that everyone that experiences transformation by the power of the gospel is called to be a living witness to those around. Amen? We are called to be a living witness as to the power of God, as to God's ability to transform lives, God's ability to intervene in the natural order. There are people here in this church, I would love to say all of us gathered here today, are called to be living witnesses, living testimonies as to the power of God and His ability to transform lives. Let's continue reading here in verse 45. However, He went out and began began to proclaim it freely and spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places and they came to Him from every direction. Did Jesus know that this man wasn't going to follow his counsel, yes or no? Jesus is the discerner of hearts, amen? And so Jesus understands that this man is not going to follow his counsel. He understands that there are going to be consequences. And the consequence that we see here is that Jesus will no longer be able to function as he has up until this point. But he goes And he continues to save this man. He continues to perform this miracle despite the cost. Now, who is wearing the cost in this situation? Jesus, amen? Jesus is the one that is wearing the cost. He is the one that is going to be inconvenienced by this miracle. And yet he continues to perform it anyway, even to the point where he himself ends up where? In the deserted places. Did you catch that? Where was this leper forced to live at the beginning of the story? In the deserted places, yeah? And so we see here that Jesus is willing to trade places with this man. His ability to save goes beyond the expectation. He actually steps into this man's situation and offers him access back into society and community. Jesus, in saving this man, trades places with him. He steps out of society, taking on the consequences of his situation in order to free him from the ailment that he's been experiencing. Is that powerful, friends? That he would go that far in saving this man? That he would inconvenience himself that much just for one individual? Now you could think, what about all the other individuals that lived in the city? What about all of those that could have been saved if Jesus continued to move throughout the city? Jesus was willing to give up access to all of those individuals so that he could save this one. Now we see that not all is lost because people follow him out of the cities. His ministry takes place on the hillsides of Galilee. But we can still see in this story, I believe that Mark is framing this story so that we get this sense 
that Jesus was willing to trade places with this individual who doesn't even have a name. He's just a guy with leprosy. He's just a guy that's unclean. I wonder if we can relate to this man at all. I wonder if we can relate to him in his condition. I wonder if we can relate to him in his cleansing. This is a powerful story, friends, of Jesus demonstrating how far he is willing to go for the salvation of humanity. Now the question is, what does this have to do with me? What is this story? How does this relate to my life? What does Jesus example here do for me in my situation? I'd like to spend a few moments today just wrestling with the principle that we have seen communicated in Jesus being willing to go above and beyond for the salvation of man. What does that actually mean for me? I'd like to go through these three things that Jesus does here. And the first one is awareness. How does this story relate to me? Well, a good question, a good place to start is, am I actually aware, am I conscious of the needs of those around me? I want to start by sharing a story um, that I experienced recently in uh, I, was, I, I had the opportunity to travel through Namibia with um, Joyce and Kim Busel, who have spent some time here at this church, um, teaching at Arise and ministering here. And I had an opportunity to visit an orphanage with them there in Namibia. And Kim was relating this experience where we're there taking photos of these children, and these are just a couple of kids that we had the opportunity to photograph here in this little orphanage. Such beautiful kids, such vibrant smiles. And as you're there and as you're photographing them, as you're filming them, one of the things they love to do is come around and see themselves on the camera. And so they come and you ask them, oh, who's this? And they'll all say, oh, that's, I can't pronounce their names. (laughs) Oh, this is, oh, this is. But one thing that we noticed was as the kids, as we're pointing to them, They were able to identify everyone else, but when it came time to pointing to them, they wouldn't know who it was. And so they would say, oh, this is, this is, and then you'd get to them and they'd be silent. And we realized that it was because they actually couldn't recognize themselves. They don't have mirrors there. They're not not constantly bombarded as we are by all of this Stuff that's going on around them, telling them to be focused on themselves. They are so other-centered that they don't even have a concept, a picture in their mind of what they look like. Isn't that beautiful? And so these kids are raised in a society where they are constantly focused on others. Does anyone else think that that contrasts our society, our current reality today? Is there ever a moment that goes by where you don't think about what your hair is doing? Is there ever a moment that goes by where you're not thinking about whether your breath smells or how people are perceiving you? Does there ever go, does a moment ever go by where you're not conscious of how you're portraying yourself to those around you? I can honestly say for me that there are not too many moments that go by in the day where I'm not totally conscious of what other people are thinking and feeling around me. Am I strange in that? You see, we're constantly being marketed to. We're constantly being told that we need to be aware of how we look. We need to buy the right clothes, to send the right messages. We need to portray ourselves in the right way. We have all of these accessories that help us communicate the message that we want to send. And I believe that all of this is gearing us towards a society where we lose the awareness of what's happening around us. We lose the awareness of how other people are feeling around us. All we're doing is constantly looking for feedback from them 
as to what we're doing, as to how we feel, as to how we're portrayed. Is that true or not true, friends? We are surrounded, we are bombarded. We live in a society, we are entrenched in this situation where we're so focused on ourselves that I believe that as a society at large, we are losing our ability to understand what other people are going through. We are losing our read on other people. These kids are just such a beautiful reminder of how far we've truly come from what I would consider to be the ideal. Let's go to James chapter 5 together. James chapter 5. We'll just turn quickly in our Bibles to James chapter 5 because it talks about the last days and it gives a picture as to how people are going to be relating to one another. And we're asking ourselves, what does this message, what does this example that Jesus set have to do with me? What does it have to do with my life? What relevance does this have to my situation? We're going to go to James chapter 1 and verse 6. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. It says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and the corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the when, in the last days. It's talking about a group of people in the last days who have been heaping up treasure for themselves, so concerned about themselves, they've lost sight of everyone else. They are so worried about their clothes, they're so worried about how much they have that they're actually losing sight of everyone around them and it's going to eat them like fire. It's going to eat them like fire. Don't miss that. It goes on to say, Indeed the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. What is this saying? It's saying that there are a group of people living in the last days that have managed to live a certain level of comfort on the backs of other people. Can we see that? Through exploitation, through Taking advantage of other people, they are living a certain lifestyle. They have managed to gain a certain lifestyle, certain status, and it's going to come back to get them. It's going to come back to get them. Why? Because we have been called as a church to be mindful of what other people are going through. We have been called to be aware of the situation of others. We have been called to be aware of not only the impact we are having, but the conditions that other people are living in. Jesus was deeply aware, deeply conscious of the situation of others. Do you agree with me, friends? That is the example that we have in Scripture But we are living in a society where exploitation has been normalized. We are are conditioned to believe that that's just a necessary part of life. And yet I don't believe it to be the case. So we have this calling as Christians to be aware of the situation of others. I want to just break away from that thought for a moment and just speak about the cost of discipleship, the cost of following Jesus. Because I believe that the the question that we are asking today is, at what cost? And you could also change that to, at whose cost or at whose expense? Jesus here in this situation puts himself into the man's shoes, literally. Literally. He puts himself into the man's situation. He wears the cost for himself. And I think something practical for us to be aware of as Christians is the cost of following Jesus. 
I remember I was in the Philippines a number of years ago, and I met this lady, and we were there in her little community preaching in the community hall there, and she was coming each night, but one of the things that was happening was uh, she was a, a Catholic by birth, and her family was um, deep-seated in the Catholic church and Catholic faith, and so um, the, the priest was standing outside of our meetings, our public meetings, watching as the members of his parish came and sat in on the meetings. This created some tension, can you imagine? Here in Australia, we aren't so forward. <laughs> but there in that society, that is somewhat normal. And so right from the get-go, for her to even attend these meetings, it was a big deal. There was a high cost involved in just her stepping foot. There was a social price for her to pay in just attending these meetings that we were running. Now, as the meetings went on, as she started making decisions throughout this process, the attacks really ramped up. The family started to come around her and put a lot of pressure on her. Her entire community started to come around her and people started to slander her in public. They started to abuse her children in public. And she still decided to follow Jesus. Amen? She still decided to follow what she believed the Bible was saying, regardless of the cost. Regardless of the cost, she was willing to be faithful to the teachings of Scripture. What an incredible example. And it, it highlighted to me the fact that in our own community, for someone to step into this church, there is a price to pay. It is not easy to step into a new social dynamic. Would anyone else agree with that? Has anyone here visited another church recently? Even if it's another Seventh-day Adventist church, it's a little bit awkward stepping into a new social setting. Amen? Amen? There's a cost involved. You have to swallow your pride a little bit to step into someone else's situation, someone else's context. And so I believe that part of the, the question that we're asking ourselves, how can we put this into practice in our own lives? One of the things that we need to be aware of is the cost that other people are paying to be a part of our community. The cost that other people are willing to pay to come into our social setting. There is a great cost. They're already expending a great deal of energy. I think the least that we can do as a community is be welcoming. Amen? The least that we can do as a community is to say, okay, someone has gone. Great, a great deal of lengths to come into my church. I'm willing to take 10 steps to go and get to know their name to make them feel comfortable. Amen? It's not that hard. It's not that great a cost for us to wear, knowing how much they've already spent to come into our social setting. Now, church isn't just a social institution. But it is still a social institution, amen? We are still a community of believers and of human beings. And there is a cost associated with trying to come into that kind of setting. I remember for me a number of years ago joining a tennis club. I love tennis. I love playing tennis. I feel very comfortable playing tennis. And yet to go and join the local tennis club, it felt awkward. I didn't know... What, the, what, what, the, what time to arrive. I didn't know where to write my name on the board. I didn't know when I'd be called up to play a game. I didn't know how they moved around the courts. I didn't even know where the bathrooms were. Everything that someone did to help orient me to that situation. The guys that came around me and said, hey, when you arrive, you write your name here and then you come wait over here and you get assigned a team. Here's the balls that you'll be playing with, and here's everything you need, and these are the guys, these are their names, welcome. That went a big way to ensuring that I felt comfortable in that social setting. I wonder how many of us are aware of the needs of others here in our own community. 
I wonder how many of us are aware, are going out of our way, willing to pay a price to go and meet someone. I'm going on about this, but I believe that this is an important point. It's a small price for us to pay, but we can make a big difference in someone else's experience here in church. Now let's think about this. If someone is considering Christianity, if someone is open to the ideas that the Bible might have validity in my life today, it might have some relevance in what I'm going through, what are some of the things that they're going to navigate in order to try and get answers to their questions? That is a minefield. There are people sitting in their homes even today that are asking themselves questions that we from Scripture are able to answer with ease. I wonder if we're expecting them to pay the price to figure out the answers and land themselves here in this church to find community here with us. Or I wonder if we're willing to go out of our way. I wonder if we're willing to pay the price and go and meet them where they are and create a way for them to come and find community with us. At what cost, friends? At whose cost are we expecting people to find themselves here as a member of Kingscliff Seventh-day Adventist Church? I believe that the example that Jesus sets forth in Scripture is one where he is willing to take on the cost, one where he is willing to go and change places so that others can find comfort and community and healing. I think that that place is a burden on all of us. I'm going to finish here on these next two points, desire and action. I just want to share a quote with you from the book Acts of the Apostles. It says, the spirit of liberality is the spirit of heaven. This spirit finds its highest manifestation in Christ's what? Sacrifice on the cross. In our behalf, the Father gave His only begotten Son. And Christ, having given up all that He had, then gave Himself that man might be what? Saved. So who was willing to pay the price in the salvation of man? Who is the one giving? The Father gave, then Jesus gave, then Jesus gave some more, then Jesus gave the ultimate. He gave Himself. Jesus is willing to give, give, give for our salvation. It says, goes on to say, the cross of Calvary should appeal to the benevolence, the kind-heartedness, the generosity of every follower of the Savior. The principle there illustrated is to what? Give, give. I love that. The principle there illustrated is to give, give. It's not enough just to give, the spirit or the the, the principle being illustrated is to what? To give, give. To give and then give some more. On the other hand, the spirit of selfishness is the spirit of Satan. The principle illustrated in the lives of worldlings is to what? To get, get. You see, we're living in a society, we're living in communities where people are so focused on what they can get that they are losing sight of the fact that people are hurting all around them. And they are actually, we are actually living in a society where we are willing to get regardless of the impact that it has on those around us. This is heavy, friend. This is heavy. We are a part of an institution, a system that has been corrupted. When we live in the world, we are surrounded by the world. And the way that the world operates, it's so focused on what it can get, get. That it's easy for us to get caught up in that same system. It's easy for us to lose sight of the focus that we are called to Give, give. And many of us have come to the point where we realize that if we are willing to give in a society that is looking to get, what happens? The fear is that we will dry up. The fear is that we will have nothing left to give. But that is not the case. 
Jesus demonstrates that when our focus is on what we can give, we don't have to focus on where it's coming from. He continues to fill us, continues to fill us so that we always have something to give. So my question for you today is very simple. What spirit is driving you? What spirit possesses you? Is it the spirit of Christ that is looking at what you can give? Or is it the spirit of the world that is looking at what you can get? Tough question. Action. What can we do with this? I believe that passively going through life, not looking to exploit others, is not enough. Just being mindful, just being aware in and of itself of the impact that we're having on others is not enough. The Bible asks us to not just be aware of the impact that we are having on others. It actually calls us to step in the gap. When people are being exploited, the Bible is telling us that we need to make up the difference. I believe that the calling that God is placing on each one of us is to actually, when we see people be exploited, when we see people that are lacking because someone has taken something that wasn't theirs, I believe the Bible is actually calling us to make up the difference. Is that a high calling, friends? Jesus comes in on the scene. He didn't cause the problems. He wasn't the one responsible for what was going on, and yet he takes responsibility. In your life, when you openly, knowingly sin, you are doing something that you shouldn't be doing. It's going to have consequences in your life. God still makes up the difference. God still saves you, even if you knew what you were doing. Now, he calls you to repentance. He asks you. He invites you. To be transformed, to be changed, yes. But he still extends forgiveness and grace, even in situations where you knew what you were doing. Amen? He is willing to pay the price, even in situations where you knowingly go against him, knowingly have an impact, negative impact on those around you. I want to just share very quickly an experience that I've had and am having at the moment. I've been invited to go across to Africa and to move to a community in Zambia, and I want to share with you the reason why. There was a situation just recently, just a couple of months ago, um, where some of the girls at this school where I was working and ministering um, had an experience where one of these girls, a teenage girl, comes up to the faculty in her school and says, I need to drop out of school. Now here in this culture, in this social context, that's what everyone talks about. Is there anyone here that's thought about dropping out of school recently? (laughs) That's just something that we joke about. If a teacher does something we don't like, I'm quitting this school, I'm never coming back. And maybe some of them do, right? So, So this student comes up and tells the teacher that they're dropping out of school. And the fact that they were sponsored to go to that school, the fact that they will never have another opportunity like that again, that you would assume they would never have an opportunity like that again come along, means that you start to ask some questions. Why would they want to drop out of school? And so the teacher begins doing a little bit of background research into what's going on in this girl's home life. And they realize that the dad had accrued a gambling debt. He'd spent far more than he had and lost it all and then fled. And so now the people that he had the debt to were coming looking for someone to pay that debt. And the next person on the list was the mum. And the mum wasn't able to pay it. And so the only solution that they had was for their two girls to be sold off. And so two girls one from our school, one from the community, is going to be sold because of a debt that they didn't have anything to do with. It is going to greatly impact the future of their lives. They will have no future from that point on, according to our life standards anyway. And so you start doing some more digging. And you realize that the 
the cost of these two girls to pay for that debt, guess how much? Guess how much it would cost for you to buy two girls in Africa their futures? It's $500. Can you believe that? They were going to be sold off for a total price of $500. Now, some of you might be willing to sell your kids for far less than that. <laughs> but the truth is that you can't put a value on a life, right? That's just in the moment. Surely that's not a constant thought that you have going through your mind. If that is, please seek help. That's not healthy. I want you to think about that for a moment. These two girls, futures would have been gone unless someone stepped in. Unless someone stepped in and said, hey, that's not right. And was willing to pay that debt even though that wasn't even their debt even though they didn't have the chance of winning big on that, <laughs> that risky move, that risky play. But the truth is that we are living in a world where this type of thing is happening all the time. And do you want to know the scary part? It's not just happening overseas. This type of exploitation is happening here on our shores. And it's not just about human trafficking. There's so many things that are happening here that are against God's will. There are so many things that are being done within our society that are against God's will. There are so many people that are powerless over their circumstances. They are born into circumstances that leave them no option in life. They are forced into some ugly situations. And we as Christians have a calling to stand in their place. We as Christians have a calling to be aware of what is going on, to have a desire to do something about it, and being willing to step in action. Amen? Aren't we called to do just that? You see, it's not just enough to be aware. It's not just enough to have a desire. I believe that if we are to follow the examples of Jesus... We are being called to be aware, yes, to step into, yes. Let's sing our closing song together. I'm going to invite our band up for our closing song. You have been called to stand in the gap today. If we are to follow Jesus' example, that is what it can look like. Let's sing together. Our last song is Shout to the Lord. Could you all stand for me, please?
have three prayer points to consider at the conclusion of our message today. Those three points are simple. First of all, that God would open my eyes. I need to be more aware. Is there anyone here that the Spirit of God has been saying to you today, I need to be more intentionally aware of what is happening in the lives of those around me? That is something that we need to be praying for, church. The next thing that we need to be praying for is a transformation of my desires. I realize that I don't always want to give, give. In fact, I rarely want to give. And I only want to give when there's something to get in return. We need to pray today that God would transform our hearts and give us a desire where we want to give, give, and then give some more. Amen? The next thing that we are going to be praying for today as a community is that God would give us the courage to stand in the gap. Maybe God has been calling you this morning to take steps, to take action, to not just be more aware of what is happening, to not just have a desire to do something, but actually to take action. And I praise God that we are a part of a church community here where people model this daily. Amen? Where people care enough to do something. It's not just one person's responsibility. It's not just a few people's responsibility. We are all called as Christians to be aware, to have a desire and then to act on that desire. Let's pray together as a church. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your example in Jesus that shows us how we are to relate to the world around us. Father, I just want to pray, first of all, that you would open my eyes. Open our eyes, Father, to the needs of those around us. Here in this room, yes. But even more so in our community, Father. Help us to be aware of what is happening in the lives of those around us. Father, we also want to pray for a complete transformation that our hearts may be transformed, that our desires may be more in line with yours. Father, we pray that you would give us a desire to give, give. And Father, as we are being more aware, as we are looking for opportunities to give, I pray that you would give us the courage to act. I pray that you would give us the courage to stand in the gap. I pray that you would give us the courage to advocate, to be a voice on behalf of those that can't speak for themselves. Father, this is a gospel calling, and I pray that each of us would take initiative, Father. We thank you so much for who you have called us to be and the way that Jesus models how we are called to live. I pray that there would be many more stories as to how this church, as to how this community continue to rally together to be a blessing to those around them. I pray that we would be a church that would be organized for service, would be organized for the meeting of the needs of our community at large. I pray that you would bless our congregation so that we can be a blessing. Father, I know that you have been speaking to us this morning. I pray that you would simply give us the courage to act on our convictions We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.